Hey, Paige. Thanks so much for doing this lecture today. Um, maybe you could just start out by telling us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hi, Kim. Uh, I'm a radiologist here at Stanford. <laughs> I'm a specialist in body MRI. Uh, and I use MR guided focus ultrasound for a variety of applications, uh, including uh, treatments in the brain. I guess we're going to talk about uh, some of the brain applications today. Great. Looking forward to it. Thanks for inviting me. So, why don't you get started? All righty. So, um, <laughs> by way of intro, we use MR guided high intensity focus ultrasound or MR guided HIFU or MR guided FUS. Those are all synonymous uh, at Stanford for a variety of applications that are shown in these images here. Um, this is for the treatment of bone metastases, so we can use it to treat painful bone metastases. These are for tumors uh, in the uterus called fibroids, uh, fairly common tumors that women get. Uh, these are for soft tissue tumors, desmoid tumors, and uh, other types of tumors in the, uh, in, the, in the extremities. And this is to treat prostate cancer. Today, we're going to be talking about its application in the brain uh, and typically for the treatment of something called essential tremor, which is uh, shaking. Uh, and we're going to be, uh, we use it to treat shaking of the hand specifically and usually the dominant hand. All right, good. I'm very excited about this. So um, as far as the, the device itself goes, uh, the technology is called transcranial MR guided focused ultrasound. And uh, we use a helmet a shaped device that's seen here. Um, for this procedure, uh, the patient has a frame attached to the skull via four pins. This frame acts like a clamp basically that holds the patient's head uh, very still on the MRI table. Uh, so the, the frame itself is uh, attached to the table. And then this helmet is uh, positioned in three planes uh, around their skull. And uh, we seal the cavity of this helmet with the silicon apron that you see here. And we fill the cavity of the helmet with uh, chilled water, which has been uh, degassed. And that becomes the medium through which the ultrasound energy is transmitted uh, in this schematic, as you can see, each of these little uh, squares is meant to represent an element. In the ultrasound transducer, there's uh, a little over a thousand elements. And then each one of these elements is um, modulated to generate energy that then traverses the, the water and then through the scalp and through the skull and through the brain um, and converging on a focal spot. Uh, for tremor, the focal spot is within the, within the thalamus. What's the temperature of the tilled water? We usually run it around uh, 14 or 15 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And Fahrenheit, that's like 50 something? <laughs> uh, I'd have to, yeah. I'd have to convert it's it, cold. but that's about right. Yeah, it's cold. It is it's cold. cold, yeah. It's cold, yeah. I think you and I have put ourselves in this thing with a swim cap on. Patients yeah, exactly. Uh, Even with my hair and the swim cap, yeah, it still cold. is very cold after 45 minutes. Yeah. And the patients are in there for several hours. They are uh, very motivated. They're very motivated. That's right. Yeah. I, I couldn't take it as long as you could um, with, uh, with the frame and with the, um, with the cold. But, and you, you're right as well, by the way. Patients have their, uh, their heads shaved for this too. Uh, although hopefully in the near future, that may not be necessary anymore. But for now, their uh, head, head is shaved so that uh, there's no air trapped in the hair. And that uh, makes transmission uh, easier. Hmm. Avoids the risk of having any uh, scattering uh, scalp, which could potentially lead to a burn. Mm -hmm. This is the treatment process. So yeah. patients are prepared for treatment, as we described with the head shave and the frame placement. And then they go into the magnet and we take pictures of the brain. We use those pictures for stereotactic planning. And uh, then so once, once we've identified the target that we want to treat, we are able to image that target with both magnitude and uh, um, phase-based, uh, PRF-based thermometry to monitor the temperature at the target as we're doing the treatment. We do this and slowly ramp up the energies and thereby ramp up the temperatures so that uh, we can kind of slowly modulate uh, a response and we can 
go in, the patient's awake. And so after these sonications, we can go in and we can um, assess the patient's response. So we can look at how their tremor is responding. We can look for any side effects. Uh, and then afterwards, we remove the frame and then we obtain images um, we obtain images of the treatment zone, as you can see here. So that's the kind of the, the general idea of the process here. Okay, that was a lot of information. Are you gonna break it down for us? Sure, I can try to go through it. Um, let's see, we could go through the process of like the treatment that we did uh, just yesterday. And, um, and then we can come back a little bit to, uh, to these steps as well. Maybe that'll be helpful. So what I was gonna say next is that uh, treatment planning involves um, identifying anatomic landmarks. This is a sagittal T2 weighted image of uh, one of our patient's heads. And we've marked here our fiducials for the anterior and posterior commissures. And this is an axial image. It's, it can be uh, acquired or, or reconstructed from these sagittal images. And so you can see the anterior and posterior commissures here. And then based on the distance between the, the anterior and posterior commissures, we typically go about 25% of that distance, the distance between the two. We go 25% of that distance anterior to the posterior commissure. And then from there, we usually go 14 millimeters laterally. Uh, so in this case, we're going towards the right thalamus to treat the left hand uh, on, on these images. We, we go 14 millimeters laterally to reach our target or 11 millimeters lateral from the wall. So we either measure 14 millimeters from the midline or 11 millimeters lateral from the wall. We often do both and compare the two. Depends a little bit on how big the patient's uh, ventricle is here. Hey, Paigey. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, just to orient the students, the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure are white matter tracks between the two hemispheres. Is that right? Yeah. And so those are dark on these pictures and what's bright is the CSF. Correct. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in green here uh, is a... Um, an impression of what the skull, of what the CT looks like, that's been fitted to the MR images. So all of these uh, procedures involve acquiring a CT scan of the head. And we use that CT scan for a few things. One, we can demarcate calcifications, for example, in the pineal gland or in the choroid. And we can tell the system, okay, we don't wanna have any of the ultrasound energy go through the regions of calcification um, within the brain. And then after that, we register the CT to the MR images. And the main reason to do that is that there's an algorithm that's applied uh, that adjusts the phase of each of those thousand elements inside the helmet based on the path that the ultrasound beam from that element takes to the target within the thalamus. Uh, and so there's the, basically phase, is, uh, phase aberration corrections applied based on the CT uh, so that uh, these elements all start off out of phase with each other, but when they reach their target within the uh, within the thalamus, they they're back in phase and coherent. So we do a number of things for targeting, and I think I'm going to switch over to Monday. And this camera shows the workstation that we use for the procedure. And let me zoom out a little bit here. So this was uh, a patient that we recently treated. And you can see images very similar to the ones I just showed you in the slides. This is an axial T2 weighted image. Again, the, the CSF spaces here are bright. So the, the brain is, is the brain parenchyma is gray. The CT here uh, is overlaid in green. You can turn off the CT and you can see the underlying bone. Uh, we've marked off areas that have calcification here in red so that we, the system won't have any energy that goes through those areas. Um, marked off the sinuses as well. Any, any air inside that fluid filled space that I mentioned to you within the cavity also gets demarcated. And we've also, as I said, we have identified, here's that sagittal image again. We've identified the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure, and then used this to then generate a, um, an image, an axial image or a series of axial images that are oriented to that ACPC plane. Uh, and um, so, so is, you can is, see, go ahead. Is, is there really air in that fluid filled cavity or is that a fold of the membrane? No, there, there's, um, there can be air trapped inside uh, up where, where the membrane is folded over. It can also be, as you're saying, some of it can be outside. 
but I, could, I think maybe some of what I showed you was is is this membrane coming up and in, and so you can see that some of this is probably outside. I don't okay. know how well you can see that. Yeah. But there also can be a little bit that's trapped inside um, between the fold of the membrane, uh, where the, the membrane is very kind of close together. Parts of it can be aposed and air can get trapped there. OK, thank yeah. you. Sure. Um, OK, so back to these images. We also pick a, a midline. So we, we go to a coronal image and pick a midline and coronal here. So that's what we've done here. We try to, again, split the ventricle here. Um, and then finally, I'll turn off one of these overlays here. Um, finally, we uh, then come back to our axial images. And from those axial images, we can pick our target. So we start off, as I've said, by measuring the distance from the anterior to the posterior commissure. And then we go 25% of that distance uh, anterior, and from there we go uh, 14 over or 11 over. In this case, we measured uh, 14, which was somewhere around there, and then we also measured 11 from the wall, which was around there. It turned out that 11 was about 15 millimeters from the midline, and then we also put. Uh, I've also got a marker in between the two, because not only am I looking at this stereo, this is the so-called stereotactic target. But I'm, I'm also uh, looking at how close the, this target is to the boundary of the thalamus. You can't see the boundary of that thalamus very well on these uh, T2 weighted images, but I have some other images that I'll show in a minute that, that help us. So I want to target the, the stereotype how do you target, know, but I also want to not get too close to the edge of the thalamus when I target. How do you know those are the right numbers to use? Isn't everybody's brain different? Absolutely, yeah. And so this is based on um, neurosurgical experience with radiofrequency ablation, with deep brain stimulation, where they use these kind of, these measurements as a uh, starting point for targeting. Um, in our case, what we'll do is we'll start with those values, and then we'll validate that they are correct, uh, primarily from patient feedback. Although, as you'll see, we have a number of other steps that we do that we layer on top of this to, to kind of confirm whether or not we're in the right place. Mm, so these are just a starting point. These are just a starting point. That's right. Okay. So, you know, this targeting, as you said, it's, uh, it's based on these measurements and it comes from the idea of, of this homunculus basically, which is the distribution in this case of uh, the nucleus that we're targeting, targeting that's called the, the VIN nucleus, the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus. And again, you can see here, we've gone about 25% anterior to PC, 25% of the distance anterior to the we posterior commissure, the and then around, in this case, about 14 and a half millimeters lateral from the midline. And our goal is to find here, the hand. We're trying to find uh, the portion of the thalamus that's controlling the hand, and we're trying to center our, uh, our ablation zone right there. You can see if we, if we go too lateral, we might uh, see changes in the leg. If we go too medial, we might see changes in um, uh, in the head. Uh, if we go to posterior, this is a sensory nucleus. And so uh, sometimes patients will complain that they feel tingling in their fingertips or around their mouth or on their tongue. And um, as you'll see, we get this feedback throughout the procedure and that helps us to eventually target here. Remember that one of the key points here is that we can gently heat and get a neurologic feedback without actually resulting in a permanent change. So before we, we do our final ablation, we will uh, neuromodulate. We'll, we'll, we'll test to see whether we're in the right place uh, with uh, relatively low energies. And then once we've confirmed that we're in a place where the tremor is getting better, the hand tremor is getting better, and we're not getting any side effects, that's when we'll raise the energy and result in a final ablation. But, what you know, what if the patient says that, uh, you know, you ask them a question and their speech is slurred? Right. So from... From that, we have some feedback, right? It probably tells us generally that we're a little too medial. And so then we, we will move more laterally away from there. Uh, we'll also look at the thermometry to help guide us as well if we see that we're eating too medially. It's possible that you can be so lateral, I suppose, that you can affect speech by being way out of the capsule. But in general, when we have a problem in that, in that scenario, it's because the target's a little too, the heating is too medial, not necessarily the target. You'll see that in a minute as well, Kim, is that it, it, there, I'll talk a lot about picking the target, but even once you have the target, there's a challenge to make the, um, 
the spot that you heat match that target. And that's, that's part of the, the, the science and the art of this still. But anyway, we start off with this uh, uh, measurement-based approach. And on top of that, we will layer an atlas-based approach where what we'll do is we'll segment the thalamus and we will, uh, we have software that deforms an atlas to then tell us where uh, within that thalamus the VIM nucleus is. And so what we're trying to do is identify that nucleus, uh, again, to find this region here and to target the hand within it. And, and that can help us to confirm, again, how far anterior and how far lateral we need to be. So you can use this atlas-based approach. Uh, some of our colleagues here, in, especially in Brian Rutt's lab, have uh, used both uh, 3T and 7T imaging of the brain. This is now a white matter nulled image. So um, you can see that the gray matter remains gray. The CSF here is still bright, but the white matter tracks have been nulled. And so you can see the boundary, as you'll see, between the thalamus and the capsule. And with, at, at higher field strengths in particular, uh, you can see some of the features within the thalamus. Uh, that can identify the different nuclei within the thalamus. And initially this was done um, uh, manually by a neuroradiologist trying to identify these various boundary zones and identifying these different nuclei. So you know, we're trying to target, in this case, uh, the VLP, VLPB. Um, different atlases have different names for VIM, but we'll be targeting here. And more recently now, uh, um, Jason Tzu in, in um, in Brian's lab and Brian Rutt's lab has taken the work that Thomas Tertius originally did and has tried to automate it. Um, he's made, so he's made a software uh, that uh, will automatically segment the thalamus using these white matter nulled images and generate um, a portion of the VIM. And what you can see here, here is in orange, um, he segmented out the VIM. And then he's looked at some of the patients that we've treated and seen where the uh, lesion occurred relative to where his software is predicting where VIM is. And you can see there's a pretty good overlap between what his software says is VIM and where we ended up ablating based on stereotactic information and based on patient feedback. So now we've gone to use, we don't use uh, his software, but we use something else um, um, uh, uh, called NeuroShape. Uh, that's a module in a software called Slicer that we use to then segment out the thalamus and uh, similarly identify VIM. You can also do- Yeah, Paige, uh, so um, that tells you a lot about uh, the structure, but it doesn't really tell you much about the function within the VIM nucleus. How much variation do you think there is between kind of like the structure of the VIM and, and like that homunculus and where the function is? Which variation is there between patients as to where the functions are? Like if you uh, always went to that location in the VIM, are you always going to get the hand portion of the homunculus? No, I think not. It, it, there's definitely variation as to where the, the ideal spot is for patients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of this is not just a balance between getting rid of the tremor, but also minimizing side effects. Mm -hmm. And so you, know, you, you, can, you can optimize tremor relief but that puts you very, very close to, let's say, the sensory nucleus or some of the cerebellar tracts that control balance. Uh, and so being, you know, too perfect can sometimes lead to unnecessary side effects, you know. Uh, and so th there definitely is variation. I think that you can you could approach this in a, in a kind of a stereotactic way and say, OK, I'm going to go I'm going to burn at 25 percent and 14 millimeters and, and just make a big enough lesion and that'll cover the area and not worry about the nuances of it, of, of you know, really trying to optimize. As long as it's you know, fairly safe and fairly effective, you're gonna get a good result. And that's one way to do this. It's a faster way to treat. Uh, we tend to take a, a, a very slow approach where we're combining this atlas-based approach. We also looked at uh, tractography. This is work out of Jennifer McNabb's lab, uh, looking at uh, a prediction of where the tracts are that run uh, between uh, the dentate nucleus and the cerebellum, the red nucleus, uh, and so the brain So this stem. is a, a chance, an opportunity. So what you're trying to do is get more specific structural information. From, for the particular patient now. That's right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. So going from just crude measurements, relatively mm -hmm. crude measurements that are uh, stereotactic based on anatomic landmarks like the AC and the PC and the edge of the ventricle and the edge of the thalamus. We, that's a starting point. But we also uh, want to say, okay, for this particular patient, where are the tracks that connect, for example, 
the dentate nucleus, the red nucleus, the thalamus, and the hand knob uh, in the cortex. So we look for those uh, streamlines as well. And we look for the intersection of those streamlines with the stereotactic and with an atlas-based approach. So we'll look to see how do those things overlap. Each of these things has a slightly, it can, can vary a little bit, you know, that the, the atlas may tell you to go here, the, the, the measurements may tell you to go there, the streamline may tell you to go there. And what we've taken, what we started to do is to look kind of for the overlap of these different approaches as a, as a very good starting point, the very sweet, that's kind of a sweet spot. We're also, uh, as you know, with uh, Gary Glover and, and Jonathan. Wait, 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 yeah. before we go there. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about this particular white matter track? Why are you tracking this white matter track and where it goes through the thalamus? Oh, well, we're, we're mostly, and, and some of this is, is just based on, uh, you know, experience, historical experience. Some of this is based on using these approaches, as I said, for let's say targeting with DBS, which is the initial alternative to this uh, treatment. Like before, first there was RF ablation, well, first maybe there was, yeah, let's say first there was RF ablation. And then uh, more recently for a while, it's been deep brain stimulation. And so you can potentially use similar targeting approaches, let's say for where to put your electrode in DBS. Um, and then now for focused ultrasound for a while, people have been using these, these tracts. And th that full tract, that dentato rubro thalamo cortical tract is one way to go, but you can actually just look to say, okay, where is the hand knob in the cortex and where do those fibers run to the thalamus and use that. You don't necessarily have to connect all the, uh, all four spots, let's say. You can look for the red nucleus to the thalamus, for example, as well. And so there's different, basically you're looking for tracts that are known to um, intersect with the VIM. Uh, region and, of the, of the thalamus. So, Paige, um, the hand the portion of the motor cortex, uh, it connects to the thalamus because the thalamus is a point of sort of feedback when, right. um, and so that's, maybe you could elaborate upon that a little bit? Uh, I would just say it's an area of kind of coordinated control, right? There's a lot of inputs that are, that are traversing from cortex, from, um, from the periphery and from the, from the brain that intersect through the thalamus. And it's a place where the control is coordinated, and uh, it's a reasonably tight target as well, for where the where a lot of this coordination is intersecting. So as a as a target, it's a reasonable place to try to intervene and have an uh, an impact on on neurologic function. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So and then again, you mentioned streamlines. So um, streamlines are basically a calculation of the white matter tracks from MRI pictures that are based on sort of the diffusion along the, the fiber versus across the fiber. And when there's a big difference, a diffusion along the fiber versus across the fiber, it can kind of calculate that's a white matter track and then come up with these lines or streamlines. That's right, yeah. So it's a way to predict which way the axons are, are flowing basically. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. uh, okay. using diffusion. Um, and so you can see here, the, um, these in, the, the, this study was looking at where the lesion is in green and comparing it to where the tractography predicted uh, the kind of the densest streamlines were. And there seemed to be a pretty good overlap between outcomes um, and the overlap of the lesion with uh, the predicted streamline, the densest streamlines connecting these uh, anatomic targets. So, so in other words, you put that lesion there based on their symptom feedback. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they had pretty good reason that that was the right place to go. And, and then you sort of looked at, is this where the streamlines were? That, that's right. We looked at whether the streamlines would have uh, predicted this. So here we were looking right. at uh, the, their, their cl clinical rating scale for tremor. We were looking at how much improvement there was uh, in their tremor score. And we we're looking at how, so this is a patient outcome on the y-axis. And then we're looking at how far the lesion was in green uh, from the tractography identified uh, target. And you know, the, the, the further it was uh, from the tractography uh, target, the less the patient's improvement was. The closer it was, the better the patient's uh, tremor improvement was. That's the-, that's the So uh, a big number on the horizontal axis or a big negative number means they had a better improvement. A big negative number on the vertical axis shows- that's uh, I mean. Yeah, yeah, more, more improvement in tremor. And a smaller distance on the x-axis means that we were close between the lesion and the predicted prediction from the tractography. People have used this in lieu of stereotactic approaches. So this is a publication from um, Caplet's group uh, in New York, where um, they looked at uh, these not just the dentata rubrofalmal cortical tract, 
but they also looked at um, the medial lemniscus as a sensory. Remember I told you the sensory nucleus is just posterior to the portion of the homunculus that we're trying to target. And then also the corticospinal tract, the motor tracts that are running in the internal capsule. And so in green here for them would be where the, uh, the target should be within the thalamus. In yellow is a sensory area that they don't want to ablate. And in red is, a, uh, is controlling motor function. Uh, in the body, and so they don't want to ablate there either. So you, they, they were targeting basically at the at this vertex here, overlapping with the green, but avoiding the red and the yellow. And you can see that on this side, and you can see that they got they had very good um, um, outcomes and a pretty reasonable comparison between their measurement based approach and uh, their tractography based approaches. So there's some validation that these approaches are are, are useful. But remember, we're we're doing all of this mostly based on patient feedback as well. Sorry, I interrupted you, Ken. You were going to say No, something. I I didn't I wasn't sure how to understand that plot right there when you said that that um that they had an improvement in their score. And so they they were looking at how much their tremor improved. And so you can see most of these patients their hand, they had a decent amount of hand tremor pre-treatment and post-treatment they had improvement. And I see. They, so on a scale of 0 to 15, the a low number here is good. Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. High number is bad, low number is good. So they went from a five to a zero, from a four to a one. They improved after treatment in a study in which they used the tractography, as, as shown here, as the means of targeting. Um, so now, as I mentioned, we're getting a lot of patient feedback from all of this, and that's based on thermometry. And so what we're doing during the procedure, uh, as the sonication is occurring, so every time we deliver the ultrasound energy, it's called the sonication, we modulate the power and the duration of these sonications to uh, achieve a, a, a goal energy. That energy is chosen to try to reach a certain temperature. As you'll see in a minute, the lower temperatures are designed to be modulatory. The higher temperatures are designed to result in a, in a permanent change, a permanent ablation to the, to the neurons there. And while we're delivering that energy, every few seconds, we get an updated image. Those images combine magnitude, so there, there's some anatomic feedback, not as good as the planning images, but still uh, recognizable. And uh, also we get temperature feedback, so we can monitor how hot the focal spot is getting. And also we can see the uh, region around the focal spot and how hot that's getting. So we want to be able to see that we're heating up primarily where we're targeting and that we're not heating up anywhere outside of where we're targeting in the danger zones all around us. Um, and so, as you can see, every few seconds, we get an updated temperature uh, it, that gets plotted versus time and tells us how hot we got. The, the red is the peak temperature in, a, in a, single, a single hottest voxel, and the green is a, is a three by three um, box and, and the average temperature uh, within, uh, within that region. And uh, so this is a, both a way for assessing efficacy during the procedure, as well as, um, as, as safety. You don't want it to get too hot. Uh, you don't want to have heating outside of the region that you're targeting. You can change your, um, your treatment parameters based on, uh, based on this as well. Using this, you can calculate thermal dose. Uh, much as we, let's say in radiation oncology, people calculate radiation dose as a a guide towards achieving some uh, goal change in, let's say, a tumor. Uh, here we can calculate thermal dose uh, to predict uh, whether or not the tissue was heated hot enough, long enough to then be, uh, be destroyed, to be killed, uh, to be ablated. So th that's, that's thermometry in a nutshell. You can explain this better than I can, I, I know, Kim, but basically the concept comes from the fact that we're looking at water and specifically the hydrogen in water. And as we all know, these uh, little hydrogen molecules, as the temperature goes up, the hydrogen bonds break. And so that just changes the precession frequency of uh, the hydrogen atom. Uh, and that's, we can use that so-called so proton resonant frequency shift as a way to, to measure thermometry in aqueous tissues. Um, practically what's happening is we acquire, um, as you know, with MR, we have magnitude and phase images. Uh, the, the magnitude images are the anatomic images that we're all used to looking at. These phase images though are, are there and you can acquire a phase image before you start heating and you can subtract that phase image from all the images that are acquired, as I said, every few seconds after the heating starts. And there's uh, again, an, an equation that looks at the change in phase 
and can be used to calculate a change in temperature, uh, assuming some constants uh, are applied. And again, this is within aqueous tissues. So you can basically look at this change in phase and use it to calculate temperature and dose. Back to the workstation. So this was us starting off here and deciding what we wanted to, to target. And we start off then uh, acquiring these uh, thermal and anatomic images. So these are the real time uh, anatomic images. We start off with an axial image, uh, looking at heating at this target. Yeah. And right. so every few seconds, you can see we get a new <laughs> axial image. And uh, same thing uh, here. We start off with these baseline um, images prior to any heating. And again, assuming there's no motion, then the only change in phase should be from, um, from temperature. And so you can see that I window this heavily. So gray means that there isn't any change and there's just a lot of noise in the image. We can right. see that sort of pattern in the background. Exactly. And if I zoom in enough, you can see that this white signal is the change in phase that's happening. So the green circle is where we target it. This yellow cursor is where uh, this temperature graph is reading out. So you can see that at the target, we reached a goal temperature of around 43 degrees. I can, I can show this to you as well by dropping the threshold here. And you can see that, so this is what the, the heat, the hot spot looked like uh, inside the targeting region here. And yeah, I'm, are, I'm not sure what you just did. You made it red. I, I dropped the uh, threshold value over here. So that number, the peak temperature here is around 43 to 45, right? Mm. So I brought the, the threshold down to show all temperatures above 42. And so this region in red reached at least 42 degrees when we targeted. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. in other words, we just took this phase information that you see here, this white signal and uh, predicted the temperature, right? Uh, we assumed that the patient's at 37 degrees. We know that as we showed before, change in phase equals change in temperature. And so we said, okay, the change in temperature here was about six degrees. Uh, and so hence 43 degrees. So we do this at the beginning because um, we have to make sure that the device is aligned to this particular patient. And by aligned, I mean that when we start the sonications, we wanna know that when we tell the system to target a particular spot, that the heating happens in exactly that spot. So the first thing that we do is to confirm that. Now there's variation in this and we'll, we can talk about this more, but one of, the, one of the things that leads to variation is the skull. So the, um, one of the parameters that we looked at is something called the skull score, which is, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but it's down here. It's the skull density ratio or skull score. And this patient is 0.74, which is a very permissive skull. It's a skull in which the ultrasound energy uh, can travel through the skull relatively easily. But you can see that now what, what, what's been done here is that that skull score has been calculated for each of the individual elements in the helmet. And so parts of this patient's skull are in red are very permissive and other parts are less permissive. Now, overall, this patient has a very, very permissive skull, right? Paige? Yeah. Uh, um, not, it's not clear what you're looking at there. You've got a circle with a lot of color on it. Right, and let me move this over and see if you can. Each of those represents one of the transducer elements. So this Correct. is sort of a projection of the hemispheric transducer onto a plane. That's right. That's right. So those are the thousand elements that I was talking about that have been projected onto um, a plane, as you said. And so this represents, you know, one of the elements and the, and it's, it's the predicted skull score for that element in its path on the way to the target that you've selected. Okay. So the target selection in, 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 impacts this and the, the, in other words, the location of the target impacts this because that's obviously part of the path. Where does it start? Where does it end up? And then the, the, the nature of the skull in between the helmet and the target impacts this as well. If it's a very thin skull, that's obviously easier to traverse. If it's a very homogeneous skull in terms of uh, homogeneous, let's say more cortical bone versus a skull that has more trabecular bone. So the more woven or trabecular bone there is, the more places there are for the ultrasound beam to kind of reflect and scatter on its way through. Uh, and the harder it can be to penetrate. The thicker the bone is, the harder it can be as well. So th th again, this is meant to be a, uh, a map showing for this particular patient, 
where are the easy places for the uh, beam to penetrate, where are the hard things, or the hard regions. And again, then this, this overall skull score is, is a, a kind of an average of each of these individual elements and, and their individual skull scores. And if I is, were, is the most superior aspect of the skull really very permissive? In this patient, it is. It, it is. This portion of the vertex of the skull is very permissive. So if I change this threshold now from one, the, the average here is 0.74. So let me just change it from uh, a max range of showing the max is one to 0.85 let's say. So you can see that overall, this patient's skull is very, very easy to penetrate. Uh, by way of some numbers, we treat patients with skull scores above 0.4 and up to, you know, we've treated 0.8 and some, some a little bit higher than that. I would say on average, people are usually in the 0.5 to 0.6 range, and people have been treated uh, that have lower skull scores, lower than 0.4. Um, but um, in this case, this is a very, very permissive skull. And so uh, you can see the portions of the skull that are relatively easy to penetrate. This is the vertex of the skull. Uh, on, this, on this projection, this is the back of the skull, the posterior skull. This is the right uh, temporal bone region, the left temporal bone region, and the right frontal and the left uh, frontal regions. So this is something that can obviously impact where the heating occurs. So you tell the system, here's the target, here's where I want you to heat. But then the nature of the skull can impact where the heating actually takes place. So you have to take this into account when you're um, when you're starting your treatment. The other thing that can impact things is the is the angle. So depending on where the patient's head is inside the helmet, some of these elements are going to hit the skull at an angle that results in reflection. And so what I've done now is I've looked at this external angle. And you can see that now whatever's in red has an external angle more than 25 degrees. So all of those elements that are now in red are not going to contribute to the spot itself because that energy from those elements is going to hit the skull and bounce off, basically. Well, uh, this is really interesting. So on the prior figure, red was good. Now red is bad. Now red is bad. And now That's you're right. showing that there's huge areas that although it was really thin, you're just not going to get much through because of the angle. That's right. That's right. And so that mm -hmm. impacts the spot shape as well. Do you have a an another one where you kind of puts both of those factors together? No, I integrate that in my head, basically. Oh, yeah, that would be easy for the computer to do. Too bad they don't give you that. Uh, yeah, that's right. So there, there, that's something. There's also a, a thickness component here, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to look and see which elements are on. Uh, and so this is the power map. Now. These elements uh, that are in black here have essentially no power being applied to them. They're essentially off. They could be off because there's air in the way. So I've told the system not to have anything go there. This patient had a scar in the back of his head. So these elements are off because I've marked the scar and I don't want the energy to go through the scar. But the other thing that I've done here is in this particular case, we were very concerned about how close to the edge of the thalamus we were getting. We were worried mostly about the medial lateral spread of the spot. And what we wanted to do is to control that medial lateral spread by turning off elements from the temporal bones, from the right and left sides of the head. Um, so what you're essentially doing is changing the shape of your aperture function when you turn those off, and that changes the shape of your focal spot. Exactly, exactly. In, in a way that we've learned with experience uh, how to predict to some extent, I would say, you know? So there's no, it doesn't do it for you. It doesn't assume or let you say, well, you want a spot shape that's like a small BB and mm -hmm. then it figure out for you what the energy should be on each of the elements. Not yet, not yet. That's, I think that's certainly doable. It's, you know, it's conceivable and hence I think very much doable. But right now we're, we're, we're doing that to some extent ourselves, trying to, you know, you, you saw the shape of that VIM nucleus in those predicted segmentation app maps that I showed you. And you saw kind of where in the VIM nucleus we think is the best spot based on kind of looking at an amalgamation of a bunch of patients put together. At the end of the day, yes, I'd like to be able to say, okay, I want you to make a, a burn that matches this particular shape. But the system doesn't do that yet. Right now, it just heats where you tell it to heat and you have to control the spread of the heat so that it stays within the regions of, that you're interested in. Um, you have the atlas, you have the trichography, you have fMRI, you have other ways of trying to optimize that target. But at the end of the day, you also have to optimize the spot shape. 
And you, and at, I guess the final arbiter, of course, is also the patient's feedback. You know, you could you could have all these predictions that tell you where the edge of the sensory nucleus is, where the um, edge of the capsule is, the thalamus is. Um, but at the end of the day, you go and ask the patient. You ask him to squeeze your hand and show you that he still has good hand strength. You ask him if he has any numbness or tingling around his mouth or in his tongue or in his fingertips. And all of that provides you feedback as well about where you're, where you're targeting. What I've done here, by the way, is I've applied a mask, uh, which are, is, a, is a way to basically tell the system which elements I want to turn off. Uh, and because we're trying to control lateral spread, we actually turned off some more of the elements from this side than this side because laterals over here. So we wanted less energy coming from this side because we were worried about being too lateral in our heating. So we, we, we really want to ideally have a very, very small spot. So you can see here, this is our first sonication in axial. Then the next thing we do is we, uh, we were, and we were aligned in that plane. Then we align in, um, the sat in a sagittal plane. Here I'm looking to see if we're off anterior to posterior. So this is a sagittal image. Let me, let me show you that here. This is a sagittal image akin to what I showed you before. There's a CT registered to this patient's head. Um, and you can see where I'm targeting within the thalamus. That's that green rectangle. And um, then I, again, I monitor for heating inside that zone. And so this is the heating, if I, I'm gonna turn the, you can see the background phase there in white. It's actually kind of too much contrast on your image there, but there, you can see the background phase there in white. And then uh, in red is the prediction. This is the area that reached, uh, the volume that reached above 46 degrees um, on, on this image. And again, we're looking for any malalignment in the AP direction in this case. Now, you know, you also see that the shape of the spot based on um, based on the overall phase, right? So there, there is like a there, there's some heating happening here. There's some heating happening down here. It's just relatively little compared to the target. So then the next thing we do now is we switch to a different plane. Uh, this is now the coronal plane, and now I'm looking for any malalignment. Here's a coronal image. Uh, and now I'm looking for any malalignment in um, the craniocaudal direction, the SI direction. And I, let me turn off some of these overlays so you can hopefully see this a little bit better. Um, so you can see here that we were targeting in the center of this green box and you can see where the, the optimal heating took place is, is lined up very much with the center of that box. And all of these temperatures, by the way, were in the mid forties these are not causing any permanent change. So th this allows us to do this alignment to this patient's head, um, taking into account all those things that I was trying to integrate about that, that, de that determine the spot shape. And then this allows me to confirm that yes, when I tell the system to heat this spot, this is exactly where it heats and not outside of that. And if I see that heating goes beyond that, I can then react to it. So these are our alignment steps. What are and those other windows that you um, have there? Like over here? Yeah. Yeah. So the temperature curve I told I showed you before, um, and then I this is these are two other things that are happening here. One, this is a window where it's listening for cavitation. So just as it transmits, parts of this helmet can listen, uh, and if it listen if it hears uh, noise that indicates that there's cavitation taking place. There are thresholds that it applies to either turn off uh, so that we don't have any cavitation. So you can see this is what happened. This is the noise that it heard during the course of this individual sonication. The system is smarter than it used to be. And what's happening down here, there's this threshold value. And as it listens for that cavitation, if, it's, if it hears cavitation, it will ramp down. It will modulate the power to try to avoid passing that threshold. So if there was a uh, uh, noise to indicate cavitation, what you would see here is that this green power curve would start to modulate. It would, you know, it would have some kind of wave function applied to it to try to avoid having that, um, ca that cavitation pass the threshold. If it, if it modulates and it's still passing the threshold, it'll just turn off. So it's a safety and, step in this process. And do you actually see that happening? See the change in the power? Yeah, does it do yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll see that. So, especially when we use higher powers, which can are more likely to, to lead to cavitation. Um, you'll see that sometimes you'll see uh, actual noise uh, in that acoustic spectrum, and then you'll see that it'll modulate power to try to avoid uh, cavitation from actually happening, from passing that threshold. 
Mm -hmm. um, the reason that you wanted to do this is, very, is a very practical one. Every time you try to deliver energy, uh, afterwards, there's a mandatory cooling time between one sonication and the next. So if you initiate a sonication and you're not able to carry it through because it, because it passes that cavitation threshold, then you've got 15 minutes where you have to sit around and wait before you can do it again. So this uh, el el nearly eliminates the chance of that happening because before it reaches that threshold where it has to stop, it will mod it'll ramp the power down and help you avoid that from happening. So if it de determines, if it detects this cavitation, it's just gonna stop and you have to do it again. And that right. just adds a sonication. And the reason why you have to wait 15 minutes between sonications has something to do with the skull, doesn't it? The skull cooling and yeah, primarily it's the skull that's heating up, right? The scalp and the skull that are heating up. You know? Each individual element is putting in very little power, but obviously the absorption coefficient for ultrasound, you know, very, very high. It's 50 times, 30 to 50 times that of, of the soft tissues. And so the reason that we have that 15 degrees Celsius water circulating around the, the, the scalp and the bone is to try to minimize the impact of heating on the, on the skull and avoid skin burns, avoid damage to the skull by doing this. Um, and so once you've heated, uh, you, you, you know, you, you, you can, uh, you have to wait for that cooling to take place. By a reference point, we, we use, we start off here with values of around 2000 joules from our very initial uh, alignment ste steps. And we rapidly reach numbers of 10, 15, you know, on Monday, we had somebody that was around 35,000 joules that we were delivering. And that just reflects how, how difficult it is to traverse the skull. If we were to do, I mentioned to you, for example, earlier that we treat uh, uterine tumors, soft tissue tumors in the uterus, there probably the maximum energies we use are 5,000 joules. So our, our starting values here are a significant chunk of the maximum values that we would use in a, in a uterine case. Um, and it's just because obviously there's no bone in the way there. You, know? mm -hmm. you can also, as you know, use this to your advantage when you're targeting bone tumors you don't need very much energy to get the bone itself very hot. So if you were trying to treat, as I showed you, that patient that had a metastasis in the iliac bone, mm -hmm. you can use this high absorption of bone to your advantage as well if you want to. But here it's a disadvantage. You have to get through the skull um, and get through it. And so you lose a lot of energy at the skull. And also you have to end up coherent at the target. What would you say is the range of um, maximum energies across patients? As little, I would say, as probably 8,000 joules might be kind and of the, the most, end, might, be, might be one of the easier patients, you know, might get us to 55 degrees to patients where we have to use 35, you know, 35 kilojoules, maybe even more. Uh, and you still don't get to 55 degrees, you get to 53 or 52, and you just keep on doing it a few times, and that adds up the dose as well, you know. So it's a pretty broad range. Uh, and we'll, we'll go back to some of your studies showing about, you know, the range of skulls as well. So yeah. this is, um, uh, this is now one of our first sonications where we're trying to achieve a, a um, neuromodulatory effect. We want to know whether our target is correct. So now we've ramped up our energies. We're now at 6,000 joules here. So it's 600 watts for uh, about 10 seconds. And you can see that um, we've reached 51 degrees at the target. This is a beautifully conformal spot. So again, it's heavily windowed for you guys, but you can see that red zone is what, what reached 51 degrees and um, it's right on target. And so you can see that measurement here as well. But you also see when I do change the window, you can see the, the background shape of the spot. You know, that yes, the, the, the highest temperatures are right at the center of that green box but you can see that there's phase change and that it's not symmetric, right? And that, that reflects that background that I was talking about, that there's differences in the skull and differences in which elements are being used and which are being reflected and so forth. And, and what we're trying to do is to optimize that to get a very nice uh, target. This is one where we went in and we got a, this is a very small region, by the way. So if I were to show you the dose overlay here, so, Show you, can I show you accumulated dose here? Yeah. So this little region here, I don't know how well, you, can you see that, Kim? Yeah, mm, in green. Oh, yeah, I can see yeah, it now. Right. Mm -hmm. So that little region is predicted to have reached thermal dose, right? Uh, 240, I believe, here. Uh, or, so it reached the threshold of 240 right, uh, right. CEM. Okay. That's right. And, and actually, this might even be lower 
So I'm trying to see if this is dark or not. Um, because it, it gives you two temp it gives you two thresholds. We'll have to see on the next one. Um, oh. Yeah. And it's saying that this region got hot enough to reach a a dose threshold. Okay. And then we went in and checked this patient, and his tremor was 50% better, even though we had targeted a very, very small region. This is by, the, by reference, by the way, this region that we're talking about here measures about two millimeters. Mm -hmm. So a tiny little two millimeter region is barely reached over 50 degrees. Uh, and, uh, and yet we saw a significant improvement in the patient's tremor. That tells us that we're right on target. We've really identified a good target for this patient. And, and he had no side effects. His speech was normal. His uh, strength was normal. His sensations were normal. And so we were able to then um, raise the temperature. And that's what we're doing on these subsequent uh, sonications. We're now uh, increasing the energies. So you can see our next one we reach, we, we go from 6,000 joules to 10,000. And now we're getting to about 56 degrees and a larger region is reaching dose uh, within, this, within this box. And so if we, again, if we go to 51, you can see this region reached 51 degrees. Uh, and and when is, you say reaching dose, you mean it's gone over the threshold that you've determined to be the, the damage threshold. That's right. Normal that's dose. right. It's predicted that this is going to be the region within the brain afterwards that has that has been ablated. Based, yeah, it's a prediction of what's been ablated. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we we just start moving our target around to kind of optimize. So you know, he, for example, this patient, we would give him a cup, and we could see that he still had a little bit of tremor. Uh, in his hand at the end, or and you might see, for example, that you've gotten his hand tremor to be better, but his upper arm tremor might still be there, and so that helps us to then remember that homunculus showed the hand, but it also showed the arm, and that helps us to figure out where to move to uh, eliminate any residual tremor that the patient has. How are you testing his tremor while he's in the MRI system? I'll I'll show you in just a second. Yeah, okay. let me let me do that now. Actually, I think this I made the point here. Uh, what's going on in these images and see if there's anything else I want to. Well, before you move off, there's this corner down there at the, the lower left that's like all red and green. What's going on with that? This region here? Wait, no, no, way down uh, when you zoomed out. Oh, right. this is noise. This is the skull, right? There's so no... it's just low MRI signal right there. That's and right, then, So it's yeah. just noise. Let me get rid of the CT uh, overlay and you can see there's no signal here. This is, this is, um, this is bone and or air within sinuses, depending on where we are, or mastoid, for example. And so you, you just, you're just getting all noise, basically. And you just know to ignore that. And we know to ignore that. You, you, can, you can move your cursor over there and look at what the, the temperature curves look like, and you can see that they're just a jumble, right? There, there's nothing that's happening here that makes any sense. It's not following any logical curve. And then you get back to the region where you're actually sonicating, you can see that these curves you know, you delivered your energy in 11 seconds, the peak occurred at 11 seconds. And then once the energy stopped, the peak cooled off. What if you go exactly inferior, like down to the, the bone there at the right. skull base? So you can see the temperatures fall off as you get further and further away. And then, you know, you wouldn't be surprised to see perhaps that some of it might go back up again. Um, well, it looks like it's going to be mostly noise. Camp. Yeah, right there, right there. Maybe yeah. Either. Yeah. Maybe, but it doesn't follow the right pattern. Well, Not wait, really. go, go up really. into the brain part. Yeah, there, there. Okay. Yeah. It's not really following a good pattern. Not so, so much. I mean, these, by the way, are the elements that are on here, right? And so you can see these are the elements that went into this spot. What's not shown here, of course, is that these elements have a near field and a far field. It's not like they, the beams all just stop right at the thalamus, right? They have some, almost all the intensity is deposited at the focus, but then some of the energy uh, goes into the far field. And uh, it's, it, there's not much left at that point. So that, as you see, there's very little heating between the, um, beyond the focal spot. But what you're getting at, of course, is what I said earlier, which is the bone is very efficient. And so even though this is, what, this is, uh, more than three centimeters away, because the bone is so efficient, you may still end up with a little bit of heating down there, but it's not something that we detect here at these energies. Mm -hmm. you know? 
Well, it's also the the thermometry is not really um, optimized for looking at or being accurate about the temperature outside the focal spot because of the way it does the referenceless correction, that's which right. is beyond the scope of what the students are going to understand. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's applied here, Kim. There there, there is this uh, background correction that's being applied here. So, you know, let me, let me turn these elements back off again. So hide all, and you can see as you go through these magnitude images that there is some noise in these images, right? And so th this, um, turning this off and on is an effort to try to correct for that background noise that's happening here. So that the system has that capability uh, to, to um, try to correct for the background phase that's happening there. And obviously that's worse when you get closer to these noisier areas. Mm -hmm. uh, um, is there anything else on these images that you that we wanted to see? No, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a nice tight spot. By the way, you, by the end, you'll notice if I show you the transducer, can you you remember what this looked like before? There was only a few rows that were off. Yeah. And now we've gone to the point where we've turned off five rows on each side here. Um, because why? Because we started to see this is a coronal image. We started to see some spread laterally. And remember I said that was where I was very concerned. I don't want to go outside of the thalamus into the internal capsule where those cortical spinal tracts are. Uh, and so what we've done is we've turned even more elements off that are coming from the sides in a way to, as in a way to, in an effort to narrow this spot as much as possible to keep it very tight and avoid lateral smearing. I have a little bit of a margin. I always give myself you know, two to three millimeters away from the edge of the capsule. Um, but, and, and that's what we're doing here as we're, we're again, spot shaping. As we turn the energies up, you have to maybe get more and more um, uh, conservative about which elements you can use. You may have to turn off more elements from the lateral portions of the, of the helmet to try to keep the spot shape the way you want. You've mentioned the capsule a couple of times. Maybe you could just elaborate on what is the capsule and why is it so important to make sure you uh, keep the heat away from there? Sure. Uh, let me show you two different ways. One is to look at it here on these white matter nulled images. So um, you can see this is a coronal image. And yeah, I don't think your mouse is going to show up. So oh, do I need to? Yeah, I have to do the annotation again. thing again. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Do you see the mouse now? Yeah. Great. So this is a, a zoomed in coronal image. On this side, uh, we've segmented the thalamus. Here's the unsegmented thalamus in gray. The portions of the ventricles here are bright, bright white. And remember that the, the white matter has been nulled, so it's black. And within this is where the corticospinal tracts run, the pyramidal tracts run. These are the fibers that um, control motor function from the periphery back to the brain, from the brain, excuse me, out to the periphery uh, are running here. So if you go too far out of the thalamus, you can hit these corticospinal tracts and result in, in weakness uh, in the hand or the leg or uh, you know, depending on what part of the corticospinal tracts you catch. You see the same thing here. Here's on an axial image, you can see the edge of the thalamus and you can see where the corticospinal tracts are running inside the internal capsule here. Yeah, it so. just really underscores <laughs> the importance of precision and image feedback and... Yes, exactly. Like, remember that's, that's what this tractography paper was looking at as well. Remember that they had demarcated the uh, corticospinal tracts and the medial lemniscus, the sensory fibers, and they, they are targeting to avoid the corticospinal tracts in the internal capsule and to avoid the sensory fibers in the portion of the thalamus posterior to, uh, to their desired target. Okay, so we talked a bit about the skull and this is what's happening here. These are all these different elements that are um, being modulated to correct their phase to account for the path that they take to the skull. Um, and again, the goal is so that when they get back um, at the target, that the beams are in phase. And so you get you know, constructive interference. Um, whereas if you don't account for that, obviously the, the, the energy, the intensity is less. And this is a, an example of some uh, of work that uh, Irvi Vias did in, in, with us in your lab. And you can see the, the variation in patient skulls, skulls that are, you know, heads that are big, 
with uh, you know very very thin bone, um, heads with very heterogeneous woven bone, trabecular bone, heads that are very dense uh, and thick, lots of cortical type bone, and you can you can try to simulate the efficiency uh, at which ultrasound traverses uh, these different skulls. Uh, and that, that's what impacts so much of what I was showing you before, that kind of art of spot shaping takes this into account. How often do you see a skull like the lower left? The lower left? Not that often because that, usually that person's skull density ratio is going to be, uh, can be too difficult. Well, no, traverse. that's going to have a very high skull density ratio. We're talking, which one are we talking about? The lower Here? left. No. Oh, I'm sorry, left. this guy? Yep. Um, well, it's very thick, but it's homogeneous is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So that's right. So um, the thickness works against you. The homogeneity works to, for you. Uh, and so you, you you'd have to predict what it is. I haven't seen too much like this. We, we have had patients where this is actually interesting. Let me see if I can turn that other. If I call, recall correctly, Paigey, the lower left is 50% more transmissive than the upper right. In the upper right. Than this one. Yeah. yeah. This trabecular bone is the worst. Thick yeah. and lots of trabecular bone, the, the beam just bounces around, right? You don't get much through there. Uh, better, I would say, is thin and homogeneous, right? Right. And then you're right. I mean, this is thick and homogeneous. So it's, it's not as bad as this one. I wanted to show you, though, um, the patient that we had on, uh, let me switch back for a second. The patient that we had on Monday was just a very First of oh. all, you can see it's quite thick. Quite so, thick. Yeah. Let me change the window, right? Quite thick and lots of trabecular bone. But also look at the front of the head here. Look how different the front and maybe the sides are compared to the back of the, of the skull here. So this patient had something called hyperostosis frontalis interna. The, the front of the skull is very thick. And if you were to try to, if you can imagine that, you know, the, the heterogeneity is not too bad. It's quite thick, but this is, this is both thick and heterogeneous here. And so if we look at this patient's uh, SDR, for one thing, the skull score was 0.5 as opposed to 0.7 in the other patients are already predicted to be difficult. But look what happens if you try to then say, okay, show me the distribution uh, of skull scores in this patient. So even though the average is 0.5, which is not too bad, you can see that the front of the head, the numbers are like 0 0.3, 0 0.2, you know, basically nothing's getting through the front relative to the top of the head, which is relatively permissive, or the back of the head and a bit of the sides. So you can imagine that if when you deliver ultrasound energy, nothing's getting through the front, everything's coming from the top and the back, and that's going to mean that your spot is going to tend to go craniocaudally, it's going to go down, and it's also going to go anteriorly because the beam is coming from the back more than from the front. And so spot shaping in this patient is much harder to try to figure out which elements you can turn on and off and how do you control uh, the shape of the spot. And um, definitely more of a challenging case in that one. But so you could, even within, you know, you're, you were looking at examples in those images of variations between patients, but this is a great example of a variation within a patient um, which makes it very hard to control the spot shape. It's doable, we did it, and it was effective, but uh, uh, again, more of a challenge than the case that, that we just looked at. Okay, so this shows that even though the, the skull density ratio is a good uh, initial estimate of who's treatable and who's not, you can treat patients that are predicted to be quite hard to treat. So this 0.4 range, um, these patients still had a pretty significant improvement in their um, in their in their tremor scores, uh, maybe not as good as the ones that were had higher um, um, higher SDRs, higher skull density ratios, but still significant. Um, and it is, however, harder to reach temperatures of if your target is a 54 degrees Celsius at your focal spot. It was much harder to reach those temperatures in these patients with lower SDRs. But then what you end up having to do is you end up treating several times. So maybe you don't get to 54 but you do 52 over and over again. And that can, that can eventually lead to the same dose, overall dose. And we, we also show that this was safe, that even though uh, you might have to treat multiple times in these patients with lower SCRs, 
their probability of adverse events was not increased. So remember that you, you had asked, how do we evaluate these patients? So we have all of this you know, information going in about the atlas, about the tractography and so forth to help us try to figure out where to target. At the end of the day, the patient's giving us their feed, this feedback. We're asking them to do neurologic tests as we're doing the procedure. So you know, we start off, as I said, with these low energies, these low temperatures to localize for that particular patient's head and skull. Then we got to the, the, the low 50s, 50, 51, to make sure that we were in the right place. And then we ramped the energy up and got to the higher 50s in, a, in an effort to coagulate and, and result in, um, in a, a final ablation. So at the beginning, everything's reversible and sublethal. And then once we're, we're safe and effective, we know we're going to be safe and effective, then we ramp things up. And here's what's happening in real time. So you said, how do we assess these patients? We, we ask them to draw a spiral. So they're lying in a, a magnet. We give them a pencil and we tell them, stay within the lines. And so you can see at the beginning, they, they can't stay within the lines. They can't draw spirals. They can't draw straight lines. Their handwriting is illegible. But then, as I said, once you, once you found that sweet spot, even a little bit of temperature increase at that sweet spot, there's already a dramatic improvement um, in how bad their tremor is. You can, you can read the, the signature probably through that tremor. Uh, and then we, we keep doing that and we maybe adjust our, um, our target a little bit based on what we're seeing. And you can see with each additional sonication here, the tremor is getting better and better. And then this is the patient a couple of hours after this. So this was the initial, and this is the final result here just a few hours later. And you can see they went from not being able to draw straight lines to drawing perfect lines and perfectly legible handwriting. We, we give them a spoon to hold, to pretend like they're feeding themselves, a cup to hold, things like that as a way to assess their, uh, their tremor. Um, and I think I'll, I'll end there, uh, give you a chance to ask some more questions, but uh, in terms of things that this is being used for now, there is uh, essential tremor, like we talked about, and then also um, Parkinson's disease. This is an example shared with us by our, our colleague, uh, Beat Werner in, uh, in Switzerland, showing one of the patients they treated with Parkinson's disease before and after treatment. Um, we started to do that. Some yeah, that's an amazing video to me. Um, you know, he's so different, not just his tremor, but his facial expression. And yes, yeah. it's just so different. And yeah. apparently he just had a, a huge change in his outlook after treatment as well. Yes. The, the Parkinsonian patients can have depression, cognitive issues. Uh, and this patient in particular, I think, had uh, a lot of, of um, uh, had a big change, I think, in outlook uh, after this. He's, he's not, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a younger, he's not an old man. Uh, and uh, I think he got a lot of his life back after this procedure. Mm -hmm. You can see at the end here, they'll show him kind of jogging up and down uh, this hallway. But so Parkinson's disease, uh, neuropathic pain has been treated. One of the original uh, targets in the thalamus in Switzerland and now part of a clinical trial. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder has been targeted, um, especially by the team in, in, in Seoul, Jin Wu Chang's team, and then also the team in Sunnybrook, and then epilepsy uh, in Japan, and also here at Stanford uh, and other sites in the US targeting uh, different targets for epilepsy, some to prevent generalization of seizure, some to try to ablate the original cause of the, the, the kind of aberrant brain tissue that's leading to the seizure to begin with. So th this is for ablation, by the way. There are, uh, there's a whole area of blood-brain barrier disruption that's uh, you know very exciting for tumor treatments and uh, and uh, maybe potentially for neurodegener neurodegenerative disorders as well. Um, that's, yep. that's under it. KG, yeah, we'll talk a little bit later in the class about blood-brain barrier opening. But I wanted to ask you about ablation versus sort of a low temperature rise uh, effect versus no temperature rise effect. And I know that you've done a lot with ablation because it's so clear that you have a, a result and it's a lasting result. <laughs> How do you think about the low temperature rise uh, non-ablative treatments? And then we'll talk about the other one after that. Well, I, th I think some of the most interesting aspects, and you're talking about uh, non-temperature rise, but um, well, no, we'll get to that one not later. Not brain barrier, but right. something that's just like a low temperature rise, yeah. um, but not ablative. Right. Or, so or I think the nicest results there that I'm aware of is, is the, the patients in Japan where they try to target for epilepsy. Um, and the intent was ablation. The intent was to get 
hot enough to burn someplace in the temporal lobe, for example. And something that we didn't touch upon is the, the way this uh, transducer is designed, it's very efficient at its geometric focus in the center of the helmet and the center of the brain, right? And so the more you move off of midline, more, further midline from the, from the center of the brain, the, the less efficient it becomes. We talked a little bit about angles and how you lose elements because of reflection, that problem gets worse. The, the fewer elements you have, obviously the, the, the higher powers you have to drive to try to get temperature, to get energies in, and it becomes more and more of a challenge. So um, in Japan, they tried to target patients with um, temporal lobe epilepsy for ablation. A couple of these patients where they were not able to reach ablative temperatures, they got, in the, I think in the high 40s, uh, and basically stopped. They realized they weren't going to get to ablative temperatures. There's no point in continuing. And yet those patients had improvement in their seizure profile. They, they, uh, fewer seizures, no seizures, off of medications, and it's been a durable effect. So something about that ultrasound intensity, separate from the temperature effect, you know, has had a neuromodulatory effect that's somehow been durable. And I, I think that, that that's very exciting because, I, I, you know, it is going to be hard to ablate everywhere in, this, in the brain with this version of this device, right, the, as conceived now. Uh, the treatment envelope for, for, at this frequency and this, you know, form factor is not everywhere in the brain. But you could uh, get to low, low temperatures or, you know, lower intensities um, in a much bigger treatment envelope. And what we need to do is maybe understand better how does that neuromodulatory effect work? What, what, what intensities are needed? Maybe go away from temperature and think about intensity and how does that, uh, how does that result in neuromodulation? There's yeah. not enough known, I think, at the basic biology level yet, really, for that. Uh, and certainly not at the clinical application level. Yeah. But so I know you're thinking about a, a trial where there's no temperaturized uh, with, with the same device. And, and how do you think about that? I know there's, there's less data for efficacy, but it's yet, it's still very exciting and worth looking at. And, and yeah, how do you think about it? So um, for example, um, so we, we, we try, we are, we have a trial where we're doing epilepsy ablation. And even with very permissive skulls, it's very challenging. You know, you're really driving the, yeah. the powers as high as you can go yeah. um, because of, you're so far off, um, off center. But um, we have another proposal that we've put in recently uh, that builds off of work. We, we talked about treating obsessive compulsive disorder or depression. People have tried to do this uh, with ablation and they've also tried to do this with uh, deep brain stimulation. But it turns out that like DBS in, in studies has not worked very well. And it's because the, the, the neural pathways in what, that lead to one person's depression probably aren't the same in, in another person. And you know, there, there may be some overlap, but there's probably some unique features in each person. And what these neuromodulatory approaches allow you to do would be to, to map out uh, for an individual person, potentially in a non-invasive way. This has been done for, for, uh, for DBS uh, in a more invasive manner where they go in and they try to map out these pathways with more invasive approaches. Um, but you could potentially do this using focus ultrasound. And uh, you know, could you see behavioral changes by reaching you know, non-ablative, sub-ablative, mm -hmm. low intensity thresholds and use that to say, okay, for this patient, this target's likely to improve their depression. For this patient, it's this other target that's likely to improve things. Yeah. So being able to map things out that way, I think is very exciting as well. So Paigey, it sounds like this is really um, kind of just really coming to the point where you're very sort of confident, you've built your clinical procedures, you're building up more uh, um, uh, um, treatments here. How do you feel about the future? Um, I think we're really kind of just beginning to scrape the surface of what this thing can do. You know, the, the premise behind it to be able to be non-invasive, obviously, or I should say minimally invasive, uh, there's, it's still neurosurgery, there's still risks, uh, but the risk profile is certainly very different than, you know, drilling through the skull and putting electrodes in or uh, radio frequency probes in. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, one is we understand the biology better for things like you said, like neuromodulation to understand that better, the, the, the electrophysiology better. And then the, the whole BBB disruption aspects of this as well. Uh, there's, there's a lot left to do. And I think that the, the premise of mapping uh, individual brain 
connections and pathways and how they may impact um, behavior and so forth could, could be very exciting as well. So I think that you know the the technology is 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 functioning, but as as you as you said, like why why don't they show these two maps on top of each other? They don't, right? Why don't they show the skull score and the external angle on top of each other? That'd be a very simple thing. Why do I have to integrate that in my head? Um, I think that the 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 next big step forward that I see, honestly, is not about targeting. I think we've understood targeting pretty well. Let's say for tremor. Uh, and we understand it, you know, probably pretty well for Parkinson's and so forth. But I think that the spot shaping aspects of this patient specific spot shaping, um, some of that's going to come from technical advances like introducing coils, so we have more signal, uh, and you're able to spend some of that signal on improved temporal resolution, multi multiplane acquisition, as you know. Uh, but then some of it is also just going to come from the ability to better control these thousand elements or several thousand elements, whatever the next version of this thing looks like, uh, to then really uh, get a nice conformal spot that's uh, designed to match that patient's, um, that pa that patient's target. You know, right, right now the patient's awake because we need that feedback to make sure that we're effective and safe. Once our targeting gets better and we're confident about the target and we're confident about our ability to shape the spot to match that target, you could do this in an asleep patient. Uh, and, and someone who's asleep, and uh, it'll be a, an easier process for that patient, I think, as well. Uh, the experience, you know, we talked about how cold it is and the pressure from the, the clamp and so forth. Um, so I think uh, th that would be a nice goal as well. Yeah. Okay, well, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much, Pagey. You're welcome. Good to, good to see you, Kim. Good to chat with you. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>